Chasta here for 107.7 The Bone and Soundwaves TV. And I'm so excited to have on my computer through the magic of Zoom, I've got Ricky Phillips of Sticks on Zoom. What's up, brother? Hey, hey, hey. Thanks for having me, Shasta. You know, I, I, I graduated from Shasta High School, so. Oh, did you? I did. And, and we already discussed before I hit record here that we share a middle name. So it's a very cosmic situation that's happening right I now. It. I love it. And you, you, you did know that I grew up in Reading, right? You grew up in Reading. I thought so. I, I remember somebody telling me that. So yeah. you, you're, I mean, you're basically Bay Area, right? You know, it seems like it, it's, uh, that's where I would escape to so yeah. I could have some fun. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I went to San Francisco State after uh, Shasta College, and uh, I quit in my senior year. Uh, probably not the wisest thing to do, but I, it seemed to work out. Well, for you, I think, uh, don't listen to this, kids, but for you, I think it worked out quite well. <laughs> That's funny. So where in the world do you live now? Where are you? I'm in Austin, Texas. That's I'm what sitting I thought. In my little studio here in Austin, Texas, where um, I write and record, do, do a lot of things. I did a lot of uh, that Hammond B3 organ right there is all over the Ronnie Montrose 10 by 10 record. I did a lot of the post-production um, overdub stuff and, and mixing and, and throwing stuff around right here in this in this room. That's incredible. So yeah, I want to talk to you in a couple of minutes about that 10 by 10 album because sure. it is such a monster album and I want to make sure that everybody has that on their go-to playlist right now. But are you spending a ton of time in that studio right now because we're all sheltering in place? And I assume in Austin, you're, you're stuck at home like we are here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it's good. It's good. I mean, in time, we... Uh, we want to get back out there. We miss what we do. We love it just like everybody misses what they love to do. And yeah, but this is this is a time to hunker down. This is a time to uh, you know let's let's get this thing past us. Yep. And when it comes back, and it probably will, let's make it this big instead of making it too big. Um, point being, um, I'm I'm down here doing a lot of work, writing bass parts for stuff as Tommy Shaw sends it to me. Mm -hmm. um, he's writing and working in Nashville where he lives. And right. then he sends me stuff here. I work on it and, um, I'm making my, eventually when we all come out from our caves, we're going to go and get, get in the room and, and uh, carve a new record, which is really, the material is really interesting. Um, I'm having a lot of fun. So it isn't like, don't feel too sorry for me. I'm actually doing what I love right here at home. Right. I know. I mean, I consider myself super lucky that I'm not on the front lines that I can work for my, this is my home studio that I can still continue to work because so many people are putting their lives on the line, first of all, and we thank Absolutely. God for them. Uh, but also, you know, are having to get out there in the world and do their essential work. So it's a good place yeah. to be where you and I are. Yeah, I for agree. Sure. Um, any of this stuff from Tommy or any members of the sticks is, is it inspired by coronavirus and what we're dealing with? Is it like, cause you heard, I don't know if you've heard yet, the Stones released a song today. Um, and it's, it says it, the name of the song is living in a ghost town as we all kind of feel like we are right now. Um, yeah. So I'm yeah. wondering about yeah. that for you. Well, it's a little prophetic cause we started writing this before all this went down, but it, there's two or three songs that I, I mean, I, I, Tommy, you wrote this before this. I mean, it sounds like it is. Oh, wow. And there's certain things. Well, it's, Styx has always had this, this way uh, of, of, from the very beginning, as far I was ever in the band, um, obviously, they had a way of having these positive messages. Right. And I think that's part of the attraction. And, you know, Styx was the first band of any kind to have four consecutive three million sellers. Jesus. And that sweet spot that they had um, is when I first, I've met the guys in 79, when I was in the babies, we opened up for sticks and that's how I met Tommy and we became okay. friends, been famous friends ever since. And when he called me 17 years ago now, almost I'm a couple months away from 17 years with sticks. Um, I mean, I didn't see that back then. Right. <laughs> see, this would be where I'd be talking to you, you know, it, 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 as far as, um, my involvement being with them at all, much less for 17 years. Right. And, the band is, has been so true to, um, there's, there's one record that I would have to maybe give a demerit on, but almost every single record, they've stuck to that sound, the tone, the, the vocals, the strength against pro prog that is, 
I mean, there's a lot of proggy stuff and a lot of odd signatures, but you don't, and you never feel like you're in a music theory class, you know, it's right. like, <laughs> right. done, it, done in a very friendly way. And I, as a musician who has done and recorded with a lot of people, done a lot of things, produced stuff and written stuff for various people, I need a challenge. And I, at this point in my life, I don't think I would be in a band if I was just kind of kicking it and playing, you know, three and four chord songs and right. big chords and then, a, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. this, this is really fun and I'm glad that Tommy and Lawrence Gowan, who's a ridiculous talent, Todd Zuckerman, who keeps getting nominated best prog or modern rock drummer, whatever, whatever, right. each year something's different. It's such a great group of guys, uh, it's such a great family. JY plays guitar. Tommy and I always say, have you ever tried to learn one of JY's solos? I mean, to play it because yeah. he's so unique. He saw Hendrix five times when he was a kid. Oh. And between that and his love, for uh, Bo Diddley and, and a lot a lot of the Chicago blues artists. Sure. Um, he's got this crazy white boy style that is really unique and has been from the very first Sticks record. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. So we're having fun. We're having fun with the new material. It, it is pretty wild though, circling back to what your question was. It is, it's just kind of, it'll sound like we did write some of this about what's going on. Yeah, it's funny that you say that because I'm a runner. And so I listen, you know, very intently with my headphones on while I'm running. And so many songs that I'm listening to that have been out for years, all of a sudden have a lyric that I'm like, yep, I feel that about right now. <laughs> it's weird. I, yeah. It's just the way you process music, isn't it? Like, that's what music always does. It's meant to be sort of universal, that we can all feel it in the same way or different way. You know, it's just, it's mad. Music is magic yeah. in that way. It's and then there's Coco Taylor who, you know, comes with wang dang doodle and, and stuff like that. I mean, right. there, it, it's kind of, uh, I, I, I just love so many different kinds of music. I've all, always have uh, never been kind of stuck in one format. Yeah. Love. There was a period of time where Led Zeppelin was it for me. You know, that was, nobody else. Was it. Hendrix was the first one to do, do that to me. Mm -hmm. But um, after a while you start when, when I, I just feel it, the teachers I had, I was at a great age, living in a small town, Redding, California. Yeah. Not a whole lot going on, but we didn't know that. We had a blast. I mean, we were snow skiing up at Mount Shasta, water skiing. It's a great place to grow up. Are you kidding? <laughs> but uh, what I was saying was, it, it's just I learned, I learned from so many great bands of of the time from the '60s, starting with the Beatles, and you learn song structure and you learn melody and you learned you that was the first time i'd ever heard a diminished chord you know in anything and mm -hmm. um you progress to i guess let's just cut straight up to led zeppelin and then you've got david bowie and you've got queen and the who you can't leave out and for me as a bass player you can't leave out john antwistle oh of course um, and and chris squire we toured with uh, yes before chris passed and um i got to hang with him and he was asking me questions about my sound which i was like yeah, mind blown. What? You know, because he's like the, the best tone, the best sound, the best. I he has such a great. I got to get up on stage and really see, check out his gear and what he was doing. Yeah, and it's elaborate. My my crew would say, no, nope, no way, we're not. Setting up that. <laughs> but uh, I was highly influenced by him. Highly influenced by wow. Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney is you know seemingly like a little mop top, but he is the just a a bad boy on that bass and. Uh, you know, between Ant Whistle and, and Squire and, and, and John Paul Jones, uh, Jack Bruce. I mean, I had the, the best teachers. Yeah, to, that's to incredible. Learn. Fast and forward I, a little bit. You, you talk about, you know, you worked on Coverdale Page. Like how you talk about Led Zeppelin. I mean, how was yeah, it yeah. working with royalty like that? I mean, Jimmy Page, like I can't even imagine, you know, him walking into a room. I would probably. Yeah, that was. <laughs> That's funny because we just this came out of a conversation a couple of days ago. Uh, it's, it's surreal even now. I, we kind of were sequestered because they wanted to keep Jimmy away from any bad habits and yes. people at the record company. And and David uh, was had this home in still does um, in the Tahoe, in Tahoe like like yeah. Tahoe area. So we kind of got away from the record company being over our shoulder and and um, it was just it was a great great time. And Incredible. We, they just, I was never supposed to actually record that record. I, David asked me if I would help them as they were writing. He, want, he knew I was a writer and he knew th that I had my own studio and he wanted me to help them. Um, not re he really, they didn't really want much input from me, mm, but they wanted okay. me to like back, 
is this solid? Let's work on this. And so Denny Carmassi and I, the drummer from Montrose, sure. uh, was just, a, it was so much fun. The four of us were just pretty much sequestered working on this material for about five months. We'd fly in and out. Um, and uh, then, then all of a sudden they were handing me um, tickets to fly up to uh, Vancouver. We recorded at Little Mountain, which was the happening studio of the day. Yeah. Had a, it just had a sound to it. And, um, and we started cutting tracks. And, and Jimmy, the very first day before, before I met Jimmy, uh -huh. Jenny and I went to have some, some, a noodle shop to have some lunch beforehand. And, and I said, you know, in one hour, we're meeting Jimmy Page. Woo. And, and that, that's, he put, put the soup spoon down and that was it for him. But <laughs> yeah. When we got there, um, We'd been there for a while. We were trying to figure out, where, where, I wonder where they're going to want us to set up because it was kind of a makeshift little room we started in. And the door burst open and it was Jimmy, big beaming smile, rushed across the room, stuck his hand out and he said, thank you guys so much for coming. This is going to be so much fun. Wow. And any, well, any guy that starts a project like that, you know, you know, okay, great. This is going to be all No right. matter who they are, you know, it's a good person. Absolutely. And we yeah. had, we had some fun. We you had, had a crazy career, man. I mean, bad English, obviously you've been in sticks for like 2003. Yeah. 17 yeah. years, 17 years, man. 17 years. So you bad English, uh, the babies. Yeah. I mean, you've done so yeah. much. And I do want to specifically talk about this album that you did for Ronnie Montrose because yeah. he's close to my heart. I've always been a big fan of his and I adore Lisa, his uh, yeah. widow. And she's, she's just, well, she's a light in the world. I think we could agree yeah. on that. Uh, but you did this album called 10 by 10 um, that is so incredible. And it was something that was started when Ronnie was living. And then you sort of took it on yourself to like make sure that this came out in the world. So thank you for that. But tell us about 10 by 10 because it is such a great album. Yeah, it, 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 it was a sort of a haunting thing for both Eric Singer and I. Eric, yeah. who most people would know as the drummer from Kiss for the past uh, almost 30 years right uh and he and i after, when ronnie passed it was it, it crushed us all we just did not see that coming so at, at a certain point in time and time had passed and um eric said we've got 10 by 10 in the can 10 basic tracks of you me and ronnie and a couple other things had been started sammy had sung a, a song okay did an amazing job um, Ronnie, it's, it's kind of funny, but I should backtrack a little bit because we were trying to find a, a singer and we couldn't find one that could really pull off all this material. And we, we tried a few. And so Ronnie called me up one day. He said, I, I, I got an idea. I want to run this idea past you. We're going to call the record 10 by 10. So that was his concept. Uh, we'll have our 10 tracks with 10 different singers. I love that and idea. Went, well, that's an incredible idea, Ronnie, but we can't find one singer. How are we going to find <laughs> So that was a joke, right? right. And, and that's when he said, well, no, I'm talking about, we'll go back to, I want to call Sammy, I want to call Edgar, and he, Mark Farner, buddies of his that he'd appreciated, worked with and, and in the past. Yeah. And um, so we started that way, and Ronnie actually got a few of these uh, guys to record, and then he was gone. So when Eric said, do you have it within you to, I was touring probably 120, 30 days a year, which translates to about 200 days on the year, uh, on the road for the year. And he said, do you, can you find time to do this? You, we, you're the only guy that knows where um, all the parts are, what Ronnie wanted, mm -hmm. what the initial concept was, and who could actually do it. And I immediately said yes, and, and thought, what have I What am I doing? What have I, what have I done, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. And it took me three years. It took me three years, and I was flying. I started off flying. Uh, the beautiful studio in San Francisco um, that I was started working in. And then I would come back and maybe two weeks later, and we'd for forget that they hadn't been kind of documented what we had done on the last. And I said, this doesn't work for me. So I called up a buddy of mine in, in Los Angeles, who is a great engineer, great, amazing talent. And I said, what's it going to cost me to lock you up for a while? Yeah. And I told him what was going on. And we worked out a deal. I, you know, did everything in this room that hadn't been done quite to these standards yet. And we worked a lot on Skype. I would fly, spend a lot of time in Los Angeles working in Los Angeles at a certain point. Uh, when Glenn Hughes, I, I, I guess I should be, it's more interesting to probably hear about some of the people that are on there. I called Edgar Winter because he had done his, his um, vocal 
and he played B3 on it. It was just a blazing track. And I said, yeah. I was trying to think who can, who could play the guitar? The only thing Ronnie hadn't done are the solos. All oh, the right. wonderful guitars, 90%, over 90% of the guitars are Ronnie. Okay. And all those tones and the way Ronnie plays and the swagger and all yeah. that, it's all there. But we needed solos. So I called Edgar and said, what do you think about Rick Derringer? I don't, every band's got dirty laundry. Are you and Rick on good terms? I think that's a fabulous idea, Ricky. I'd love to have Rick on this record. <laughs> so we, uh, I got a hold of Rick. He was, he lives in Florida and um, set him up at the studio. And I didn't have time to fly there. So I talked to the engineer and said, look, he knows it's, he knows, I don't have to tell him too much. He, he and Ronnie aren't that far apart. They were in both in the Edgar Winter group. Sure. It's just all I got to say, my, my only note is this. Remember, this is a Ronnie record, which I told every guitar player, remember, this is Ronnie Montrose. This isn't, you know, Ronnie belie believed that music should move, it should ebb, it should flow, and that a guitar solo should start off, and it should be real sexy. And you don't start off with the frenzy at the beginning of sex, Ronnie would always say. You, know, you, you, <laughs> build, you build to the frenzy. Yeah. So that was the one note I had for all the guitar players, but everybody did such a wonderful job. Going back to Sammy, Sammy did this gorgeous song. He did such, I remember the track was difficult because for at one point I was going to start writing lyrics and melodies because none of the singers we found were really kind of capable of it. Yeah. And um, Sammy, he just, he, he just wrote this beautiful, beautiful lyric. Um, very, very, just wonderful track. And he sang, it, it's, it's just amazing. But yeah. we had to have the right player on that. And that one, that track, called for a little more than just a blues rock player. So um, he had suggested a couple guys that I hadn't ever heard Ronnie say that he approved of, but I mm -hmm. did know in the back of my head, I said, what about Steve Lukather? Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, I've never worked with him. I don't know, do you know him? I said, yeah. I said, we've been friends for a lot. A lot. Let me call him. I tracked him down, he was in Singapore, actually. I think he was working with Pat Metheny on a short little tour or something. Got back to me and said, I'm, I'm be honored to do that. I'm, I'm so happy you guys thought of me. And his solo is incredible. It's, it's blow away. There's so many yeah. blow away performances. There even really though, are. Even though there's just people came in for a brief moment on a on a big record that had already been recorded, their brief moment, everybody was in there with their heart and soul and, and, and for Ronnie. Yeah. Um, and that's honestly, that's what you feel, Ricky. Like when you listen to it, you yeah. do feel that heart and soul. You know, it's, a, it's an amazing album because when you really think about it, um, all the history that goes into that album, honestly, you know, with Ronnie doing it and then his yeah. passing and you guys all having to pick up the pieces and, and have it in your heart to be able to find the strength to do it too, because I'm sure that was hard on you. You know, you guys have had to grieve Ronnie and then put all this back together. Um, that is a real, I would assume. It was, it, it was uh, cathartic, I guess. I mean, it was... Yeah, uh, Therapy? It was good therapy. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. It, I got, I felt like I was with Ronnie every day. Yeah. You know, and I didn't want it to end. Mm. You know? That's so great. That's so great. the three years I spent, it was, whew, I don't know if I could do it again, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was, it was really a good time. And I was very, I always felt like when there was trouble and I was having trouble with the track and well, I guess something here isn't working. Boom. Ronnie on my shoulder. He was I there. Just thought, what would Ronnie do? Yep. And I'd, I'd channel Ronnie, and it was it, all of a sudden the next day it was done. You Gosh. know, um, yeah. it, it, the record really had its had its magical. Everybody felt it. Yeah. Everybody felt it. There were some tears at oh. at times in the studio. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure there were. If you guys have not checked out Ten by Ten, um, really, honestly, it is such an incredible album, and the the roster of people that are on that album is just mind boggling. It's such a great tribute to Ronnie, um, no. and I I feel it, and I feel you, and I just I adore everything that you do. Um, and I did want to ask you. So, this question is sort of evolved. Um, all of the rock stars that I interview, I always ask them the same question. It comes from a um, my favorite movie, Almost Famous. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, great movie. Uh, but at the end of the movie, they ask, what do you love about music? So that's typically the question. But right now, it seems like instead of love, the question really is meaning. What is meaning in music right now? Because to me, in my opinion, I won't give my answer. No one cares. But like, it's really bringing us together. It's what you know, is, is the cement to people. So right now, Ricky Phillips, what does music mean to you? Wow. Well, music has been uh, a huge blessing 
in my life. I could have gone, I slept on a lot of couches in Los Angeles before um, I got a break, but I, I did get lucky. I got my break, I'd only been in Los Angeles for three weeks when I got a gig with this band, and it wasn't that band that I rose to any notoriety in, but I was seen by the sound man for the babies. Mm. Who, it was, they were a British rock band who had just come over, they, they moved to uh, Beverly Hills, yeah. and they were looking for, John Waite didn't want to be the bass player anymore. He just wanted to sing. So um, I had spent two or three years traveling around the country, playing rock bars and saloons across the country do, and playing four and five sets a night. And that was my graduate school. You know, yeah. that was, instead of doing it at San Francisco State, I, I did it on the road because when I got to Los Angeles, what I noticed that by playing five sets a night every night for all those, you know, two and a half, three, actually maybe four years. Yeah. Um, I was ready. I didn't, I don't think I knew it, but I'd walk into audition for something and, and you sit out in the hall and you've got a guy in there and you're listening, you're going, God, where's that guy? You kidding me? And yeah. He thinks he's going to get the gig, you know, kind of thing. You get a little cocky, right? Sure. You have to, you have to believe in yourself. And um, so I started climbing that ladder and, uh, but I got this gig that really started my career. And I was, I mean, I was down and out. I had, I had nothing. I landed in Los Angeles with 20 borrowed dollars in my pocket. Yeah. That's how I started. Wow. So um, it, for me, it's been a blessing because I've made such dear friends that are still John Waite and, and Tony and Wally, Jonathan Kane. We're, I love those guys. I mean, we're, we're, we went through the trenches. Um, there was, it looks like we had a great, wonderful time in the babies. Well, we, we, there were some struggles going on. Sure. And uh, we got through it, and so much so that when Journey was going to split up in the late 80s, when they finally, uh, at that point, uh, decided to call it quits, um, Jonathan, I was at Jonathan Kane's brother's wedding, and he pulled me aside and said, we're going to let the press know that we're splitting up, and I want to be ready with something. Are, 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 do you want to, are you in? And we were putting a game plan together, but, you know, life's what happens when you're making other plans, because that's really? what we were going to do not, was not what happened. He ran into John Waite in New York. Wow. And he called me and he said, I had dinner with Bling Bingo last night and he, he wants in, you know, and that was our nickname for, for John Waite. Right. And um, we, went, we said, let's go to San Francisco and where Jonathan lived out in, outside in, uh, I think he was in San Anselmo. And we, we see if we still had any kind of magic together. And um, so through friendship and, and the love of music, Bad English was born. John, uh, Neil started coming over and putting solos down for us. Yeah. And then at, for, for the longest time, he didn't, he didn't want to commit because he hadn't, since before Santana, he'd been in a rock band. He just wanted to do a solo thing. Right. But after we were about to, he heard we were about to sign another guitar player, he flew down to Los Angeles where we had moved the project. Yeah. Hang on a second, one second. Uh -huh. Oh, <laughs> kitty cat, loves, I love it. He loves this part of the story, so that's why he came in. Uh, <laughs> I love it. Anyway, uh, he, uh, he barged in the door of the rehearsal. I mean, it's this poor guy that we were about to hire was a fantastic guitarist, wonderful guitarist. Yeah. Texas boy, and he was staying with me uh, in my house in Los Angeles while we were doing this. And I, the look on his face when Neil walked in, in the room, it, oh. on all of our faces, we didn't, yeah. I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't see it coming. But then here's bad English. Uh, cut to, um, I mean, that's how I met David Coverdale. Right. David Coverdale called me and asked me if I'd do a rec record with him or, or work on this record with him and, and Jimmy Page and ended up recording with them as well. But um, through being in bad English, Tommy Shaw and I had a friendship. So yeah. music, there's so many friendships I had in Los Angeles, working in the studio, being a session player for several years in between bands and just really trying to do what I called the Hollywood shuffle to, to pay, pay the, the rent or the mortgage or whatever it was and wherever you were in your career. Yeah. And um, as a matter of fact, I had just accepted writing 21 pieces and recording of music for an industrial film when Todd Zuckerman, the drummer in Sticks, called me up and said, hey man, I didn't know this, but you're on JY and Tommy's radar and, 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 uh, um, and he's Sam San Francisco. Are you sitting down? Because you need to sit down and relax. What's going on here? <laughs> and he said, I just heard that, th that you're at the top of the list and th they're going to call you and see if you want to join Sticks. And Whoa. Um, I didn't see that coming. 
Yeah, Todd, yeah. Todd, 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 Todd and I met doing sessions in Los Angeles, and he's a monster drummer. I yeah. mean, a monster drummer. Uh, I don't know what he can't do. I mean, it's, he could play with any kind of music. I can't even think of a, any kind of music he would, couldn't absolutely do, and you'd think he, he, that's all he did. Right. Uh, amazing drummer. He's maybe a better bass player. He is so good. Wow. Um, anyway, so here I am with this great family, the Sticks family, and who knows where it'll go from here, but I've been able to still do other things, and uh, music has just been a blessing. It's just been a constant blessing. Isn't it amazing how music just weave, it weaves its way through, through all those parts of your life, no matter where you were and who you're with, it's like, it was always that binding connection to people. And that's what I find so fascinating about it. It's just, it yeah. really is the glue that binds us. And I think right now, you know, that's why I work on the radio. I play rock music, I play a lot of sticks, by the way, <laughs> gladly oh. and proudly. Um, and, you know, for 1077 The Bone and Soundwaves TV, um, you know, we, we, push out Bay Area musicians and play local um, music and, and their videos. And it, we find it really important. I really feel like it's a cause to push because I, yeah. I feel like music is super important. So yeah, I mean, people, we, we used to, when I, when I was a kid, I should say my whole family were a bunch of hams. My dad did local theater and they cast my mom at there. He couldn't find the, the, you know, the female role. Yeah. Um, cast me when I was a kid, which I wasn't as crazy about it as my brother was. I wanted to play little league baseball. Uh -huh. And so when my brother was old enough, he, he went in there, but my brother went on to be, uh, we, we sang on every vacation and we sang Beatles songs, all four harmony parts, whatever it was in the car on the way skiing or whatever it was we were doing. And my brother ended up uh, being discovered by Maurice Bejart when he was like 18 years old and sent, he went straight to uh, Brussels, Belgium to be with Bejart Ballet. And then he went wow. to Kerbergen Ballet. Um, and I have, I should say, I have three stepsisters. So there's five of us. But we're, I was the oldest. My brother was, was a freshman. We had twins who were juniors, and and uh, and then Dana was was a sophomore. But Kathleen Kennedy, who is the producer, and she's now the um, uh, the head of Lucasfilm. Um, she started off her first movie she produced was E.T. and and all the Spielberg movies, pra practically all, mm -hmm. up until a certain point. And now she's uh, in her own right. And her her uh, my twin sister Connie, or her twin. Connie um, is also a production in film and is doing very well. Wow. Dana, Dana had her own talk show in Seattle. Wow. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, every single one of us came from Redding, California. Somehow, we didn't grow up together. Our, our, uh, matter of fact, it was my sister Connie who called me and says, do you know what's going on? And I said, no, uh, what are you talking about? She said, with our parents. I said, what are you talking about? And she goes, they're dating and it's serious. You know? Oh. <laughs> So, you know, you hear from your future sister. Right. Oh, but, my God. Uh, great. A great fun family. Amazing, amazing. Uh, I, just, I just feel like all around me there was enough talent for me to glean off of and kind of uh, immerse myself in and then found my way. And my That's way, an every, enormous amount of talent in one family. <laughs> yeah. each, each person went off sort of drifting in their own, their own direction, but yeah. uh, everybody somehow took advantage of it. Wow. That's incredible. Ricky, I could literally talk to you all day. I super appreciate you you uh, spending some time with me here on Zoom Absolutely. Home Studio. I, I really am excited to hear what comes out of that, especially since now I've had a personal view into yes. it. Yes. It'll yeah. be cool to see what comes oh, out of that. I can show that. you one thing. One, yeah, please. One thing. This, this face, I, I bought off the wall when I was in a, in playing bar bands. It yeah. ended up, it was the, the, the only bass I played on Union Jacks with the babies. Okay. Um, I did a lot of the tracks on 10 by 10 with this bass through, you know, just through my SVT uh, rig. And that it's also on the last Styx record mm. uh, on three, if not four songs. Okay. And uh, this is just like, this, this, this is one of my best friends. I got a lot of basses. I, I got mean, that is, that's your baby. But this is a 1968 Telecaster bass that uh, I bought for a hundred bucks off, off the wall of a music store called Marguerite's. And, um, you know, th this guy, this guy got me the gig to get started and, uh, and it's still here. Dude, that is so rad. That should be such a huge inspiration to kids who want to get into music. Like you were able to buy that for a hundred bucks and then look at your career and where it's gone now. Yeah. yeah. That brought tears to my eyes. That's oh. <laughs> so cool. Thank I you. love it. Thank you. Wow, Ricky. Well, thank you so much. Please tell your family. Thank you for uh, giving me some time with you today. 
Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll be in touch. By the way, I adore your radio promotions guy. He and I chatted for like half an hour before you and I even <laughs> started chatting. Yeah, yeah. Terry will talk. Awesome. So, yeah, yeah, it's great connecting with all of you guys. Thank you so much for being here. You really too, great. Shasta. Thanks so much. Had a all lot right. of fun. You take care of yourself for sure, especially right now. Please. You too. All righty. Have a good one. Okay.